Well, two weeks ago, our sermon series on Genesis 1 looked at the tremendous reality that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, meaning everything there is, everything you see, everything you don't see. That's the simple declaration of Genesis 1, verse 1. And then we looked in at the early creative acts of God, separating the light from the darkness, separating the water above, the precipitation, from the waters below, the oceans, and forming dry land and on one side and oceans on the other. Last week, we considered God's creation of the sun and the moon, as well as the stars. Not just our earth, not just our solar system spinning around the sun, but the entire universe, vast and beautiful, all of it came from God's hand. And now we come to the creation of fish and birds, animals and people. We start in verse 20 with this divine command. <clears throat> let the waters teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sea. Perhaps you've seen the marvelous BBC documentary series Planet Earth. It's um, presented by Sir David Attenborough, and every once in a while, I want to pretend that I can talk like him. <laughs> and it features one gorgeous video shot after another. Uh, one of our sons is a, a filmmaker, and, uh, and when Planet Earth comes on our TV, when we put in the DVD, he takes a look and he thinks, my goodness, that's beautiful. Oh, that's beautiful. And he's not talking about the things that are, he's talking about the photography. And, but the, the, the real stars of planet Earth are the rocks and trees, the skies and seas, the fish, the birds, and the animals. L for example, the petrel birds of Antarctica, which need to lay their eggs on bare rocks and so they fly 400 kilometers inland to find just the right place. Except that the right place doesn't have any food. And so they make this 800 kilometer return trip over and over and over again so that their new ones will have a bite to eat. Or how about the long-nosed, long-tongued bats? One of your favorites, I know who travel north from Mexico to escape the summer heat. But how will they survive as they cross the Arizona desert? No problem. As the desert cools at night, the cacti bloom, and those bats refuel on the nectar of the cactus flowers that bloom in the middle of the night. It's amazing. And David Attenborough could go on and on and on. And all this beauty and diversity is there because God said, let the water teem with living creatures. Let there be 10,000 species of birds. Let there be lots and lots of animals, both wild and domesticated. And God blessed them, Genesis 1 says. Our text for today says, and God blessed them and said, have lots of babies. And it was good. Very good. The Lord of all creation wants every species to flourish. Now, before we move on to the crown of creation, human beings, there's one other thing that I want to mention about the birds and fish and animals and whatnot. 
it would be dangerous, you know, to be specific about one particular bird or plant or animal. It's all very general in Genesis chapter 1, but, but the author makes an exception for one particular group. And in Genesis 1.21, Moses adds that God created the great creatures of the sea. And by that, the author of Genesis is talking about whales. But there's an interesting controversy swimming along behind those orcas and humpbacks. And I'm not talking about the controversy about them being caught in nets in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, which is serious enough. I'm talking about a controversy that made sense to the people who heard this for the first time and, pe and the person who wrote it for the first time, who, who put it down on paper. You see, the, water, the, the word used here for these great creatures of the sea is the same word that Israel's neighbors, the Canaanites, used for a mythological sea monster that confronted their gods. And the Babylonians, a little bit off to the whatever direction that is, east, had a chaos monster of their own named Tiamat. And, and so this, when, when, when Moses mentions the great creatures of the sea, the, he's talking about the whales, but he's challenging the worldview of the people around him who saw them as, well, evil influences and troublesome spiritual realities. And according to Genesis, all of that, from the Canaanites and the Babylonians, all of that is religious mumbo-jumbo. The great sea monsters are just magnificent creatures enjoying God's blessing like all the rest. They're just whales already. And they were made by God. Some people see something scary under every rock and fill their lives with superstitions. They allow themselves to sometimes be controlled by the dark forces and mythical creatures of their imagination. But this word from God in Genesis tells us that everything in the world, everything there is, was made by God. No exceptions. And the things that intimidate us are only creatures. Scary, maybe, but basically understandable. Difficult to deal with sometimes, yes, but under God's control. Everything we have to deal with <clears throat> was made by God, who has the final say and the ultimate sovereignty. Just like the devil has been defeated by Jesus at the cross, every other evil influence, every other superstition that you could name, all of them are simply things that have been created by God. And Jesus has the victory over them. God has the sovereignty over them. They're part of the providence that God has. And all we need to do is ask God to help, to deliver us from those fears Because Jesus is the victor over all of them. Well, let me move on quickly because we have to realize and appreciate the most important thing about this whole chapter. And that is that after forming the places and filling them with lots of interesting wildlife, God says, let us make human beings. Well, in one sense, people are just a part of God's good creation. The last in a list, but part of the list. That creation is marvelously interrelated. We're all in the same boat called planet Earth. The creation is all of a piece. People and plants, protozoa and poplars, platypuses and pussy willows, they're all part of the intricate web of creation. After all, both animals and humans were made on the sixth day of creation, and we're meant to get along. People are part of that one creation. It's been said that the flutter of butterfly wings here has an impact on the water temperature there. We're in this together. 
And so we have a solemn and God-given responsibility to treat the creation respectfully, to reduce carbon emissions, for example, to not pollute the water, and to save the whales. Our actions should honor the interdependence of which we're a part, should honor the fact that, that God wants all things to flourish. But having said that, however, something else and something very different emerges from Genesis chapter 1. Human beings are not only part of creation, they're also the culmination of God's creative process. They're the crown of creation. We get a hint of that in the first few words when God says, not let there be X, Y, or Z, but let us make human beings. The narrative slows down a bit. The words are become a bit more deliberate and deliberative. And the plural us is unusual, prompting us to think that something significant and important is about to be described. Let us make man in our image. Humans are special. They're made in God's image, in God's likeness. And we're going to say a little bit more about that in a minute, but whatever it means, it means that humans are distinctive. They're the ones and the only ones who are made in the image of God. Platypuses might be interesting, but people are godlike. And then God says, and these two ideas belong together, after he mentions humanity made in the image of God, then God says, let these human beings rule over every creature in all the earth. God has put people in charge. There is a higher and a lower in creation with a job for humanity to do in manage, managing and utilizing and caring for the world God made. The people who get squeamish when a plant is cut down or an animal is made for, into food are forgetting the fact that God has given these things to us for our benefit. But that assertion is increasingly controversial today. Here's the dash of controversy in today's creation sermon. A few centuries ago, it became clear that the earth wasn't the center of the universe, of the solar system. And humanity's central place in creation was called into question. We've come to learn that the genome of the chimpanzee is supposedly over 98% identical with the human genome. We're not that too far apart. And just last month, did you hear in the news, two Dal philosophy profs have joined a legal fight to have two privately owned chimpanzees declared persons and transferred to a sanctuary where they'll be better off. And so maybe it's arrogant to call humans the crown of creation. In the words of German theologian Christoph Schoenbrunn, Schoenbrunn, I knew I was going to kick that one around, today we read and hear that, when faith that while faith raised man high above all other living belong beings, science has cast him down from his lofty pedestal. However, and that's my third or fourth but in a row, there are answers to these assertions as well. There are real differences between animals and humans. The image of God doesn't just develop from some lower form. Reason, spirit, soul, these aspects of human personality are given, not grown. If evolution plays a limited part in the creation process, as some believe, Christians still say that God was and is in charge, carrying out the divine plan. The emergence of humanity, writes Schoenborn, comes from a purposeful and not a merely accidental process. And even if it's true that chimpanzees and human beings have largely the same genome, no chimpanzee will ever take an interest in its genome. 
to say nothing of decoding it. So, how should we view our uniqueness and importance in this vast universe? The answer lies in our text, of course. People are made in the image of God. And that's an idea with several important dimensions. The most important of those dimensions is that the image of God is born by Jesus Christ. It's worn by our Savior who became human like us while remaining fully divine as well. Jesus is the very image of the invisible God, says Colossians 1.15. And when we look at him, we see what we are meant to be. We see what we were created like. We see the great place from which we've fallen. And we see what we are made to become. Yes, we need to be redeemed by Christ and then transformed, sanctified, conformed to the image of Christ. There's that language again. Refashioned to be like Jesus, who is the image of God. This image of God is has a moral reality to it, a dimension, a moral dimension. God is loving and holy. God does beautiful things and right things. And we were created to be like that. We're called to be loving and holy because we bear the image of God, and God is loving and holy. It's also, the image of God is also a relational concept. God creates one who can live in community, and connect with God. We weren't meant to be alone. Later in the light of New Testament teaching about God the Trinity, this becomes even more obvious. God is a relational being. God is Father, Son, and Spirit who connect intimately with each other in the, in the divine communion. And we have been fashioned in that image, in the image of God, so that we could connect with each other. So that we could find the fullness of what it means to be alive and human in our relationships with other people. And most importantly, in our relationship with God. We were made to connect with the creator of the universe. And not only does the image of God have a Christocentric and a moral and a relational aspect, but it also has connections with responsibility. It seems that part of what it means to be made in the image of God is to have dominion over creation. To rule over the fish and birds and animals, even over the earth itself. Those two things, image and rule, belong together. They're mentioned in the very same breath in Genesis 1.26, which is the key verse that's printed on the front of today's bulletin. God said, let us make human beings in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule. In the ancient Near East, I'm told, kings marked their conquest of lands by setting up images of themselves in the conquered territories as a sign of their authority. Similarly, God places in the wider creation a creature who bears his image. And those humans are given the task of representing God and acting on God's behalf. How's that for a high calling? We're God's agents and representatives. We're commissioned to rule over the earth, to populate it, even to subdue it. That means fishing for food. It means cultivating animals in order that we could have milk and meat. It means, well, it means conscious, consciously and conscientiously having a stewardship over the earth, using it but not abusing it. These commands are not to be interpreted as a, as a, a, a license to do whatever we want. Instead, we're to exercise our leading role, our authority role, 
as the bearers of a serious responsibility. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, Man is to rule as one who receives the commission and power of his dominion from God. We are to rule, but God is our ruler. And so we should respect the creation and be wise in our decisions about the environment so that development is sustainable and resources aren't wasted. We should take charge without taking advantage. Well, that's a lot, I know, to put into one sermon. It's a lot to put into three sermons. And now we come to the very end of Genesis chapter 31. And this is my closing thought to you today. When God has finished making all of these things, sun and moon and stars, fish and birds and animals, even and especially human beings, God takes a step back and says, Ah, that's very, very good. God saw all that he had made, Genesis 1.31, and it was very good. God is enthusiastically commending his handiwork to us. As he contemplates what he's made, he has a, a satisfaction that is like an artist looking at a painting. That's like a craftsperson seeing what comes from the lathe or the, the workshop. Like a gardener who sees the things organized just in the right way. It was perfect. There was no complaint. God was very pleased. John Calvin puts it like this. 500 years ago, he said, Now after the workmanship of the world was complete in all its parts and had received the last finishing touches, God pronounces it perfectly good. There is, Calvin says, in the symmetry of God's works, the highest perfection to which nothing can be added. God saw that it was very good. We have a world around us that has been made beautiful, that has been created for us, that has been given to us in trust. And God saw that it was just perfect. Sadly, there's a second chapter to the story. And in fact, if you read chapters 2 and 3 of Genesis, you'll discover what happened next. We abused that creation. We turned away from God. We rejected God's purposes. We said we knew better. But still, God renews creation for us. Every spring we notice it particularly. God renews creation for us, a good creation in order that we could be blessed by it, in order that we could rule over it responsibly. It's quite a challenge. It's often very difficult. But it's our task, given by a great, creative God.